Good afternoon. I hope this finds you doing well. Uh, this Sunday, or this, this weekend, we're beginning looking at a sermon series on the book of Ezra, and, and Ezra and the prophets that get involved in the middle of his life, uh, Haggai. Excuse me, Haggai and Zechariah. Uh, one announcement, announcement before we get started with that. Uh, on August 23rd, the day before school begins on August 24th, everyone is welcome to come to the South Shelby Elementary School, the newly built school, to join together in a uh, short service to pray for and bless the school and all of those who will be in it in the coming days. And so that's August 23rd, 2 p.m. outside Rainer shine and because it's outside we don't have to worry about masks just social distancing and all of this the churches of clarence and all the churches of shelbina are invited to come and uh, to send their pastors or a representative to help pray for the school i'll uh, hopefully be able to organize this and this should go well the reading for this day comes from the book of ezra the first chapter in the first year of king cyrus of persia in order that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished. The Lord stirred up the spirit of King Cyrus of Persia so that he sent a herald throughout all of his kingdom and also in a written edict declared. Thus says, the king, says King Cyrus of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem in Judah. Any of those among you who are of his people may their God be with them, are now permitted to go up to Jerusalem and Judah and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. And let all survivors in whatever place they reside be assisted by the people of their place with silver and gold, with goods and with animals, besides free will offerings for the house of God in Jerusalem. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every time that I preach out of the Old Testament for any length, I have to stop and go and look at the timeline again and uh, make sure I understand where we are in the sense of what's happening, the events of the Old Testament. And we're about to spend a couple weeks with one particular place in the Old Testament looking at the story of Ezra, and uh, as well as the two people who get involved in that time period as well, the prophets Haggai. Zechariah. And so before we jump into the beginning of Ezra, let's take a moment and let's situate ourselves where we are in the history of Israel in the Middle East. So we all know of this fellow named King David. He's the fellow who brought together the 12 tribes of Israel, and he's back at 1041 BC, right? His son, then in 972 BC, his son, King Solomon, is the one who builds the temple, the really big temple in Jerusalem. And it is Solomon's son, a fellow by the name of Rehoboam, who is such an arrogant uh, young man, just a big chip on his shoulder, that leads to the, the nation or, or the kingdom of Israel, the 12 tribes of Israel, splitting into the 10 northern tribes of Israel and the two southern tribes go off and form Judah. And so that's 931. And so from 931 until 721, about 200 years, give or take, right? These two kingdoms exist side by side until in 721, one of the first empires to ever exist, the Assyrian Empire, comes in and destroys the northern kingdom, the ten northern tribes. And then uh, in 626, the Babylonian Empire replaces the Assyrian Empire, and then it's in 586 that the Babylonian Empire comes in and they don't destroy the southern kingdom of Judah. What they do is they take all of the people and they send them into exile. That's in 586. And so it's at this moment that the temple in Jerusalem, this temple that had been built all the way back in 972 BC, it's destroyed. The Babylonians destroy the temple in 586. This temple that had st stood for 400 years. Now, the prophet Jeremiah had told the people 
in the years running up to the exile in 586. He had told them either shape up or ship out. That's how it's going to go. And when you leave, you're going to be gone for some decades. So when you get there and you're going because you're being so stubborn right now, when you get go into exile, settle down, seek the good of the place where you will be, and then after 70 years, you will be able to go home. And that's where we pick up with Ezra. In 536 BC, in the first year of the new Persian Empire, the first emperor, Cyrus, sends the Jewish people home so that they can build their temple and worship God. And his request of them is that as they worship, that they should pray for him. And so that's kind of that leads up to where where we're going to be for a while. Just to recap, so David, King David, the, the kingdom of Israel begins around 1000 BC, right? Then 720 BC is when the Assyrian Empire destroys the northern chunk of the kingdom, Israel, of the ten tribes of Israel. 586 is when the Babylonian Empire deports all of the southern kingdom of Judah, and then we pick up at 536 when all the, the per Persian frees all the Jewish people and sends them home. And so that, that's, that's where we're at. That's how, how we got there. Now Cyrus is one of the more fascinating people in Scripture because he is one of, he is one of two people in Scripture who is called anointed. Right? He is called a Messiah. The, the first you, you know about, we talk about him often. He goes by the name of Jesus. The set, this is the other person in Scripture who gets called by that term. And it only happens once. Jesus is called anointed or Messiah often. This only happens once for Cyrus. So there's no claim that he is any divine or anything, but he is the one, and it's in Isaiah 45, we read, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have grasped to subdue nations before him and strip kings of their robes to open doors and the gates shall not be closed. I will go before you and level the mountains. I will break in pieces the doors of bronze and cut through the bars of iron. That's what Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, has to say about this, this emperor Cyrus. Right? Cyrus is the one who frees the people that Babylon has imprisoned, cutting through the bars of iron, That, uh, as Isaiah puts it. The, the bars of iron, if you think of like the bars of a prison, that, that's how I understand this. Right? And so this is doing what the prophet uh, Jeremiah had spoken about. This is, the prophet Jeremiah is the guy who shows up before the exile and tells them, like, this is coming, you better shape up, right? And when it becomes clear that this is going to happen, right? You, they're going to go into exile. Jeremiah starts telling them, you know, this is going to happen, but you need to have some hope. Let, let me tell you. And it's in uh, Jeremiah 29, we read, For thus says the Lord, when Babylon's 70 years are completed, will I visit you, and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place, bring you back to Israel, right, the promised land. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm, to give you a future with hope. Then when you call on me, upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. When you search for me, you will find me, if you seek me with all of your heart. I will let you find me, says the Lord. I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I have driven you, says the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I sent you into exile. So here's this like moment of hope, right? You're going to go into exile, but after 70 years, I'm bringing you home, right? So you are not forgotten. This is just what needs to happen right now as a consequence of, of what you have done. And so in... This is what we find happening in Ezra. The first chapter of Ezra, we read of Cyrus saying, go home, take the stuff, take the, all the things that you have used to worship previously that Babylon took from you. You take all of the pieces, the gold, the silver you used for in your worship, take it and go and rebuild your temple and please be sure to pray for me and go. And then in Ezra 2, that's where we start seeing it come to pass. That's where the, the ball gets rolling, right? This is where the, they start 
uh, getting going. And the first thing they do as they get going is they count everyone. All right, and this is an amazing moment because you count everyone before you go on a trip. I, I have this mental image of getting in the car and you're like going down the road and you have a, lot, you have a van full of teenagers and, and, and I, I've taken some trips with youth groups, right? A van full of teenagers and, and before you get back on the road, when you stop and turn around, you look at them all and you count them because you're going to be traveling a while and you want to make sure you have all of them. You count each and every one of them because every single one of them matters right you need to have the, the number that you started with right? and that's what this moment is they're about to go on this journey this 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 great trip to go home and so they count everybody every single last person and it only happens one other place in scripture it happens in the book of numbers Right. In Ezra, it happens as they're going out of, uh, out of their exile and they're going to their promised land for the second time. Numbers is what happens. So Exodus is the story of Moses and the freeing of the people out of Egypt. And then Numbers is the story of them actually going, the traveling to the promised land. So Numbers gets its name, Numbers, because it is the numbering, the counting of all of the people. They're doing the same thing. Right? They're about to go to the promised land, so it's time to count everybody. Uh, it makes it clear the way they count that this is a second exodus. Right? This is another moment. This is the second time that God is leading his chosen people to the promised land, giving them hope. Like, we're going home now. Let me make sure we have every last one of you. And, and okay, now jump in the van and, and here, here we go. Now, there is a difference here. There is a, a difference. They're going home, but they're going home having paid a price for their lack of faithfulness. They're paying a price as a people for or having gone astray. Right? If you add up everyone who went to the promised land in the first exodus, you'll come up with 603,550. And that's a lot of people, 600,000 people. If you read in Ezra, when they did their count, they came up with 49,697. Still a lot of people, but this is like a tenth of the size, right? They, have, they had walked away from faithful and holy living, which is, Google wants to talk to me. It's awkward. Uh, they had walked away from holy living. They'd walked away from faithful living when they were living in, in the, the kingdom of Judah. And, and now they're, they'd paid a consequence for it. They'd paid a price. They, they've had to learn a lesson. God still loves them and God is still bringing them home. But there's a lot less of them now. And then we come to Ezra 3. Right? We read of the people getting home and how they get right back to worship as soon as they get their farms up and running. Right? We, we read like they have to get to worship and they do after seven months, but they have to first they have to scatter across the land and they have to get their farms up and going. And that takes some time. It takes about seven months. I cannot imagine walking out onto some land and trying to get a farm up and going after having been ignored for a while. A long while. All right, so after seven months, they, everyone gathers together in Jerusalem and they begin to worship together again. They build the altar, they start celebrating the festivals and making the, the sacrifices. That, is, that was how the, the, their relationship to God was mediated at that time. And um, they realize that they need to get moving on more than just an altar. And so they begin to plan to rebuild the temple. So after seven months there, they start worship again, having got their farms up and running. And then we read that after two years, they, they, they gather again and, and they lay the foundation stone. They lay the cornerstone. And it is admittedly somewhat striking that uh, some things don't change. Construction takes a while to set up. And even when it is the single most important thing that they can do, it still takes them over a year to go from, we should start building the temple to laying the first foundation stone. So construction is hard and some things take time. 
And this is the, so this is how the first piece of the story of Ezra, of Ezra wraps up, right? They, they are laying the cornerstone. And, and as they lay the cornerstone, the, the priests are there in their garb, and, and the trumpets are blowing, and the cymbals are crashing, and they're singing responsively. They're singing the Psalms of David, and, and they're leading the people in worship. And this is a really big moment. And how do people respond? Are you have thousands of people there. This is the moment that they are rebuilding the temple that's the heart of the nation, uh, the heart of the kingdom, and, and how do they respond? And all the people responded with a great shout when they praised the Lord because the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and heads of families, old people who had seen the first house on its foundation, wept with a loud voice when they saw this house, though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound of the joyful shout from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted so loudly that the sound was heard from far away. Sounds like a bit of a jumble, a bit of a confused mess of reactions. Some people being excited for something good happening in the middle of a stressful time. There was something that good that they could hold on to and they could shout and sing and get excited about. And isn't this wonderful, right? Finally, something we can get excited about. And then there were the people who were weeping because they knew what had been lost. They, they were grieving the things that were not to be. Right? They were grieving what, what wasn't going to happen. Right? And this sort of complicated set of reactions, I got to say, I'm, I'm there. Like, <laughs> this moment, this beginning of fall in 2020, feels kind of like that, right? It feels like an accurate and fitting moment. I, just in my own family, like there's the, in my, I'm the only one of my family who's not going back to school, or Fletcher's going to school for the first time, and there's like joy and excitement about like, get to go, Fletcher gets to go to school, he's excited, right? Sophia gets to go see her friends, Olivia's going to get to lead people in creating music, creating beauty on a, a daily basis, and this is awesome, this is wonderful, this is a joyous thing, and... Uh, it's also a moment of stress, of concern, of like, how is this going to go? How is this going to unfold? Is this going to go well? Like, there are people who are sick, and Missouri has this count of how many people a day are being sick. And that's just like one snapshot of how my family is thinking through and experiencing this moment. There's the joy, there's the concern, and it's kind of a mess. And which is the right response? Well, I don't think there is a right response. There's just the response we have in the moment that we have it. Right? This is a moment in Ezra. It's a moment in the story of God's people that is complicated. And I don't think that can be avoided. I don't think we can like make this anything other than the, the kind of the mess that it is. There is a, a, a real joy to it. They're rebuilding the temple. And there's a real grieving to it. That uh, grief for the temple that was lost. What isn't complicated, thank God, is that they do have a path forward. We know they have a path forward, and here is the path forward. They, as a people, their path forward is the same as ours. Patience with each other as different people react in their own way. Right, back then, they had to be patient with each other. The ones who wept and the ones who rejoiced like, probably are in the same family. Right? So some, some will weep and some will rejoice, and that, that's okay to be patient with each other in this. Right? Also, a commitment to building what is next. Right? That, that is true then and it is true today. Like they were starting to build the temple and now it is time for them to build what was next. Right? Even if as they were confused in the middle of res responding to that moment, and that is still true of us today, we are still needing to be committed to building what is next. And, and it's, it's complicated and I do not know what it will look like in many ways. But we are building our, our way forward as we follow Jesus as the, the, the church that, that we love. And most of all, the same thing is true back then, back, back two and a half millennia ago, as it is today. That we walk into this future with, with trust. 
with a deep reservoir of trust built up in like God has gotten us through thus far. God will get us through what is next. Right? We, we walk into this uh, knowing that there are going to be highs and there are going to be lows, but in the end we are following Jesus. And what is that God's will is going to be done on earth as it is in heaven. May we walk into this future with patience with each other, commitment to building what is next, and trust that God's will is going to be done. And I look forward to walking through this book of Ezra with you to see how it unfolds for them, just as much as I look forward to walking through these coming months to figure out, see how, they, how God is good and walks with us through what is to come. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, may we who gather in this interesting time be able to rest assured that we can trust you with our future. We pray that we might faithfully build this future, whether we are building temples or building our own community or building, focusing on building lives that are faithful to you. We pray for this coming season as schools open. We pray for all of those who are involved, for the teachers, the nurses, the administration, the students, the parents, the janitors, the secretaries, all the people who will be able to work. We pray that they might be able to work together so that those we love are kept safe and our communities are well served. We pray for those who are making the decisions about how this will unfold. We continue to pray for those who are in the medical field and caring for those who are sick. We pray for the scientists who are researching the, the vaccines that we will uh, use to be able to get back to living a, a something approximating normal. We pray for all of these things as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I hope you have a joyous and restful Sabbath. And uh, may the peace of Christ be with you this day and always. Amen.